Good morning. My name is John Crowley. Uh, I am going to talk a bit on OpenStreetMap as it reflects within climate and crisis. Um, one of the most important bits, usually it's a formality. Uh, institutions like people to at least state what hat they're speaking from. For me, that's usually more complicated than most. And some of you will chuckle at this because I wear a lot of hats. Um, some of them I'm working with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Some of them I work with the World Bank. I work here at the UN on data for climate action with the big data initiative called UN Global Pulse. And I work with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. I am talking from none of those hats today. Um, this is actually an important point. It's one that I'm going to bring as a theme within this presentation about our hats and how important it is to state them. I will bring this out in, in crisis and you'll see exactly why because this actually begins to impact on our community and our, the trust that we're been creating in what we're doing. And I'm, I'm gonna speak a little bit about that because of a really important point. We have a really great and growing responsibility within the world of crisis. Many of you have been following what's been going on with the use of OpenStreetMap in Nepal. It dates back to Haiti, was really the first application that we saw for its use within a crisis. We have a really growing network of partners we have private sector entities. We have many entities that are coming in from the intergovernmental space. This is the UN. This is the World Bank. We have aspects that are coming in from the donor community. We have folks that are beginning to invest in what's happening. And the expectations are rising. We have news stories that are emerging about how fast we're mapping places that traditionally have really not had a digital map. These are the latest stats from Nepal, courtesy of Mark Farah from uh, DevSeed this morning. Uh, just by reference, Haiti, which changed everyone's mind about what OpenStreetMap can do, was 640 mappers with 1.4 million edits. Look at these stats for Nepal, and this is ongoing. We are blowing things out of the water. We are creating a sense of community around the data that we're doing, but we're also facing a new responsibility that goes way beyond mapping bike lanes. We're now generating maps that people are using to make decisions. Some of those decisions impact lives on the ground. And we're going to have to come up to a point where we're going to have to look and say, you know what, we need to mature as an organization. And the way we might do that, one tried and true method is to look how others have already done this. Uh, which institutions have already set up processes for dealing with this type of, of humanitarian responsibility. I'm going to look at this a bit from Larry Lessig's standpoint. How many of you have read code? A lot. This is good. Larry Lessig wrote a book uh, basically comparing software code and the way the instructions that we give to a, a set of classes or methods and the way that we should define things and begin to look at institutions and law as a set of codes, a little bit slower changing a little bit, in a sense, more malleable. Institutions do work a lot like software. Um, some of them work better than others. Some of them have a lot of bugs. But ultimately, the process that they set up for their policies are things where we can begin to look at it as software code. It, it, it sort of sets the bounds on what that institution can and cannot do. There are policies that prevent it from doing things, just like we set software for preventing uh, the, the, what we're trying to do from getting outside of the bounds of what we want it to do. Importantly, many of these policies encode the lessons learned, the mistakes, the screw-ups into tools that allow us to begin to prevent them from happening in the future. And we see this a lot in humanitarian action. Much of what we've tried to do in crisis has been motivated and, and, and essentially set up in its design from reactions of our mistakes in previous disasters. Some of you may remember the 2004 tsunami across the Asian, uh, across the Indian Ocean tsunami. This was the enormous set of, uh, shall we say, lessons learned for the humanitarian community on how to go about a process of responding to a massive catastrophic disaster. One of the key points is humanitarians respond when there are two points that get met. One, the disaster has to overwhelm the national capacity. I'm not talking the local capacity, the local fire department or police department. 
I'm talking the national capacity of, of a country to be able to provide mutual aid to its various structures. And that member state has to also make a formal request for international aid to come in. In other words, there's a mandate for the folks to be able to come in and work. Some of these structures have emerged from mistakes. And as much as we may want to criticize the cluster system, this is a process by which humanitarians work. We have a set of functional areas that are coordinated by an emergency response coordinator with an information function in the middle called the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, which is based in this building. Many of these organizations have offices, if not headquarters, in this building. This process of beginning to build out this functional uh, map of who does what, where, is actually one of the core things that you see built as a map during an emergency, is the 3W map, who, what, where. It's important to realize that even this is only one form of the aid that flows. There are many things where countries, US, Australia, Dutch, send bilateral aid, where we have our own USAID, often, or UK aid branded uh, paraphernalia that we send into the field, and it's being done through a bilateral agreement, government to government. And we always seem to forget that there are domestic agencies, domestic non-governmental organizations that work in the place that we're working in too. All of them have their own sets of codes, not all of which are set up to have really clean APIs, not all of which coordinate very well, many of which step on each other, and almost all of which don't have really good signaling between them about how they're supposed to be coordinated. So as a result, you'll see a colorful map, a gamut of vests and hats out in the field. The vest is kind of like an API. We can discern a lot from it. Um, yeah, it's branding for fundraising. Set that aside. It tells us a lot about that organization. It tells us about the reputation of that organization. How often have they delivered in the past? Do they, say, do, they do what they say they're going to do? And we can interact with that vest in a different way depending on who it is or if they don't have a vest. If they're in a place where they're an organization that has simply showed up and we've seen more and more of this disaster tourism uh, for small mom and pops or even individuals showing up in the field, sometimes with only briefcases of money, good luck. There's a lot of issues that come up with trust. By knowing the reputation, I can really look at someone coming from the organization that I don't know and probably make a lot of inferences about how much I can trust that organization. I'm gonna wing this all the way back to OpenStreetMap in a second. Trust under stress is one of the hardest things. Oftentimes we're working under duress, we're tired, sweaty, haven't eaten, are worried about uh, a deadline, at the same time we're worried about a colleague who hasn't checked in. This is a lot of mental, co it's cognitive load, and having that level of trust of knowing who we can interact with quickly and be able to work off that reputation and know that something's gonna get done is really critical. In the process of trying to get things done, we often make compromises. Some of these compromises we see a lot of criticism about. We mix open and closed data. Yep, we create radioactive gray matter which can't be used anywhere else in order to generate a decision on the timeline we need. It happens all the time. That's not something that our community accepts as its core value. We're always looking at how does it react, to, how can we bring this data in on our license, how can we use it in OpenStreetMap? How can we make it widely available and permanently available? We've been working with these institutions. I'm, there are a bunch of us that are sort of go back and forth between the open world and working inside of the institution and trying to make change. Some of us are working from the inside. It's a slow process. This is not a GitHub check-in. The code that we're working with requires a lot of trust building to change. And that's beginning to happen. The World Bank has begun processes of, of using open data to drive hundreds of millions of dollars of investment by working with communities, by building mapping communities in Indonesia, in Malawi, in Nepal now. 
we're beginning to see the work happen in the UN, where we're using OpenStreetMap to begin to drive decisions. OCHA has set it up as one of the core parts of the common operational data set. This is a choice of maps. If OpenStreetMap is the best, or could be simple, quickly the best, it's used to drive the operation. And we're seeing more and more of this trust building, which brings up an interesting question. As we begin to work within these institutions and we're beginning to drive decisions on an intergovernmental level, what's HOTS code? What have we set up for the way that we work on that process? And I, I say we in, in, as, as simply a member of HOT. I'm not trying to speak as, as a leader of HOT. But one of the key things to keep in mind is that HOT's a solution to a design challenge. It's a set of compromises, a set of engineering compromises on the way that it's designed. And there's a lot of confusion about this because we have an open street map community, we have a hot community, there's a lot of interplay on the mapping of crisis where folks from OpenStreetMap contribute into an act activation of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. But the clarity is a little bit loose. There's a bit of par several parts to the way that we've set up the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. One of them is the remote mapping that we've seen. This is the, cur the current map of Haiti, uh, which when we started was basically a couple of roads. Now we have building footprints with a lot of information about the building. Some of them even have particular water sites with the hours that they're open and a cell phone number of the person to call if it's broken. We're the only people that can do that. And that's an incredibly valuable remote mapping tool, but it's not possible without people on the ground to be able to add that data in. This is the team in Kathmandu working at a table outside uh, just after the earthquake as they begin to uh, coordinate some of the work that's happening around mapping. We rely on these on the ground mappers. We're also at a point now where institutions are taking these maps and driving operations. This is also from Haiti. This is one of the EU humanitarian operations teams uh, using this as the base map for their planning their operations. And we have a lot more agreements that are coming into place from international institutions the Missing Maps Initiative, the Open Cities Project, Open Data for Resilience. We're seeing it used in the Humanitarian Data Exchange from the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. HOT has to balance all of these various communities. We have communities on the ground. We have communities that we've been mobilizing. We have communities that are here, are, are, are set up to be remote mapping and contributing in interesting ways. We have our institutions. And we have the open street map community as well. And as any of you know, the OSM lists can be fun. We're a bridge. And we have to be able to balance that. Working between is very hard. And it's not something that is ever going to be perfect. And we're never going to be a purist. When designing HOT and designing for working in crisis, we had to keep a few things in mind. In general, we don't trust institutions. We don't think they move fast enough. We don't think that they do their job well. We don't think that they're able to be flexible to the circumstance, that they can't redesign and uh, to match changing uh, context very quickly, and they may not necessarily understand the local culture all that well. But we need them, and we need to be one. And the formal institutions need us to be an institution that they can put a contract to, that they can put a grant to, that they can give an in-kind donation of imagery to, it's really hard to give that to an amorphous crowd. And trust me, because I've tried since 2005. Um, it is not easy to get imagery to something that is a, an unincorporated, what the formal institutions tend to call an unincorporated association of volunteers. And there are a lot of liabilities that come along with giving it to an unassociated, associ unaffiliated association of volunteers which the institutions are not willing to accept themselves. The donors also require a lot of relationship management. I don't know how many of you have worked with donors, but they want a single point of contact, they want a clear set of messaging, and they don't actually often want to know all of the nitty gritty things that are going wrong that are in our issue list. That's not the way that we interact with them. And we need to be able to have a very clear understanding of how to do that that's something that we're beginning to violate. And we're actually having trouble understanding that we need to create an API to donors. 
The communities that we work with often benefit from our mobilization and training. Um, they often don't necessarily have the, the skills to be able to step in and do the mapping, to set up uh, not just using a GPS unit, but learning the cultural aspects of OpenStreetMap and how to interact with the community, how to begin to create a curated data set of their own locality, that's stuff that it's useful to have a trainer. And we found HOT has had to be able to provide that as a service for formal institutions that want to build those communities. And it's a great intermediary role for us to have because it's actually a revenue model. Yet, that, motion, that mobilization itself can get dangerous, and we have to balance certain aspects of the way that we do it so we're actually empowering local communities as opposed to beginning to uh, just impose another replication of structures that honestly have a few problems. In the process of building for crisis, we had to acknowledge a few other realities, and they're very practical. Remote mapping is great. We see an enormous amount of energy around it, but it doesn't always work without someone on the ground to verify it. And this is particularly important for building level data where if we want to use it for a model, we want to use it for some kind of an algorithm, we need to have someone eyeball it, we need to have someone look at it, we need to have someone uh, assess a particular structure's fragility, how vulnerable is it to an earthquake. Those type of data can only be discerned at eye level. We've tried with UAVs, don't bring it up. We've tried with aircraft, don't bring it up. We've tried with, you know, five to 10 centimeter imagery and obliques, doesn't work. You need an eyeball. And that's, I think, the, the thing where we're uniquely set up to do this. Field mapping efforts often find these remote mapping efforts to be very useful, but not when it imposes an entire map on a community, and not when it turns into something where it's somebody else's map imposed onto the local team. This is something that it's been a dynamic that as we've talked and, and begun to work, I used to work at the World Bank's GF Global Facility of Disaster Re Risk Reduction Recovery. It actually became a, a design principle that we can't do this without having a local community involved. Even though it's great to have the, the map, it's not curated. It's not something, it's something that begins to become stale and, and doesn't actually stay up to date. So that feedback loop between the remote mapping and the local mapping becomes a critical part of what we need to design when we work for crisis. This is one of the design challenges that we're faced with right now. We need to be able to set up that feedback loop so that it's constantly working, constantly growing, and we're constantly learning how to do this better. I think we've just begun this process. And it's something that as we begin to work more and more in the communities where we have crisis, we need to be able to set that up from the beginning on how we do it. It's not just code, it's actual process. It's code in the other sense of institutionalization. What's more critical is when we get a catastrophic emergency, that feedback loop we're finding really requires someone who knows how to do it from the outset. We can't experiment as we do it. We've taken on a responsibility for curating a map that people are using to drive decisions in real time. And we need someone to be able to react in real time and not learn in real time. And that's something that as mappers begin to interact with HOT, this is the role that HOT is taking on more and more, and we're beginning to, to look for others to begin to help us with that process. If you want to become engaged, this is one area. But I also want to keep in mind one thing. It's not just about the map. We often get consumed with our conversations about the map, but it's about more than that. Maps enable the decisions, and those decisions are really a core part of what it means to be part of crisis, and what it increasingly is gonna mean to be part of climate and some of the development goals that are now gonna be driven by maps, in part because of efforts that we have created. HOT has created a lot of trust in this hat. And when you go and you speak in the name of OpenStreetMap, or you go and speak in the name of Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, be aware that you're carrying the reputation with you. And even though you may not necessarily always agree with processes, it's not necessarily the time to express them during the crisis. You can work them through other ways. You can work them through HOT. You can work them through OSM. But this process is something that, um, as we begin to do this, there are a lot of folks who are freelancing. 
and I mean freelancing and stepping outside the system and saying, no, there's a better way to do this, and representing themselves as hot in this hat when it's not actually hot's position. I want to just emphasize how far this trust has taken us. I mentioned that I started working on trying to get pixels out in about 2005. Well, this, oop, this is the map that my friend used to drive the logistics operation for Banda Aceh. This is six weeks in. This is not pixels. This was all that was available on the ground. There were pixels available in the, in the headquarters. But on the ground in Banda Aceh, they were using maps. That was not acceptable. We couldn't find where the affected population had changed. Land masses had disappeared. Entire villages were no longer there. That process of figuring out how to get to the pixels was something that became a passion for many of us. In 2009, there was a process for beginning to look and say, you know what, maybe we could get some pixels out by using the next view license that had been signed with, uh, between Digital Globe, GOI, and the US government to be able to share with partners. It had been designed for that. And we began to look at how to do this for Afghanistan. And this is, this is the actual brick uh, being carried to a, a small place where we started to look at how could we take the early walking papers and make it usable so that we could take the vectors and overlay it over this satellite imagery, and send it back to Afghanistan to use for monitoring the election. And it turned out, because of a number of circumstances, it was one of two election monitoring tools that actually, instead of being a test, went live immediately. A little scary, but um, that process of making that happen created a lot of trust. And what ended up happening with Haiti expanded that. It wasn't the first thing that happened. There had been years of work to make this moment happen. And when Digital Globe and GUI made one meter imagery available for open use for 30 days and then 60 days, it catalyzed many of you to contribute. How many of you contributed to the Haiti mapping? We still have quite a few. And that process, you were one of the 640 that made that map happen, really made something else happen. What we ended up happening with the, we saw the State Department's Humanitarian Information Unit, and I think most of the team is here, uh, began to work on pulling out a workflow so that we could actually get imagery out and pixels out during an emergency. This workflow was enabled by the tasking manager. This was the trust mechanism. The pixels never left the US government. There's the WMS in the background uh, for whatever editor you're using. And we created a click-through on the license so that people could make sure that they were abiding by the license terms. And then the imagery was, could be traced, and then the map could be used commercially, um, which was part of the OSM license. And that was, we had to balance a lot of things to make that happen, and I can, I assure you, that getting to this moment, which is when we had a, a yes come in from the lawyers that controlled that contract that it could be done, that was an enormous amount of compromises, an enormous number of things where we were trying to keep relationships in balance. It's still fragile. It's not something that's just a given. We earn this. And this is something that, as we look at MapGive, realize that this was the work of dozens of people to try and make this happen both in our community and in the formal institutions that made this happen. So I want to just ask how we're keeping this trust. The building this relationships is hard and building it as a growing community where we have more and more people being able to do more and more great things requires a little bit more communication. And I think we've had some problems. In Haiti, we saw quite a number of folks step outside of HOT and take, or not, a couple of people, sign personal contracts that were in conflict of interest. We've seen a petition to the space charter claiming that the pixel should be released as a matter of human rights. That's, we're not an inter intergovernmental organization. We did not sign that treaty and we do not have standing to send an email to 50 people that are members of that charter. We do have an ability to work through one of its members to be able to make a request to try and do that. But our mechanism of doing it was instead to piss everyone off instead of working through the code and working with the API as it exists. We have another thing where we have to keep our reputation. 
And we're seeing more and more snide tweets come about uh, data that may not be open to everyone. There may be reasons for that. There may be reasons you don't understand. There may be reasons that are licensing that we're, we're already working on and trying to get it open. And in the case of one of the tweets from Nepal, that is the case. But that doesn't help our cause. It makes us look like a bunch of, uh, you know, Richard Stallmans trying to be a zealot for something where instead we can actually advocate and begin to move in a compromising position towards that or making compromises. We had movements to try and create separate workflows and separate ch uh, chat channels, which could have potentially violated everything that we worked for years to do. And most recently, we had some public criticisms of donors. Those, who, how, like those of you who do donor management probably know that this is generally a bad idea. Um, so, you know, work with us, uh, you know, in the process of, of doing this. We have a big community, but we have now a channel to be able to work on this. Hot is not GNU. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're not setting up a, a zealotry about open, but we advocate. We are setting up something where we earn these privileges to be part of this international community and participating in it. And there's a lot of things that you all can help in beginning to earn this privilege. There are a couple of design challenges that we need to meet as we go around this. The sustainable development goals are going to replace the millennial development goals in September. And we're in a place now where many of those goals are going to need to be driven by mapping. Whose map are they going to use? Is it a map imposed on a community or a map built from community? We're uniquely positioned to do that. The World Humanitarian Summit will meet in 2016. If we're at a point where all of these communities that were interacting in humanitarian operations are deeply enmeshed in uh, long-term operations, whose map are they using? We have more and more work and investment that are happening in disaster risk reduction, particularly as climate change may open this up. Whose map are they using? Mostly from the World, World Bank, ours. And as we begin to look at the climate conference, the, what map is being used to model the transport and the energy costs that come along with it? It's not us. This is mostly a different type of mapping that's being done. And this is something that's near and dear to me because now I'm the program manager for Data for Climate Action, which is how do we apply big data to understanding the activities that we're doing around climate. And I just want you to take a look at this. This is Uganda, Kampala, and this is from Call Data Records. We can begin to look at individual mobility across all of a city, but whose map are we using to do this? We can begin to become that map. Come on. Um, ultimately, the power of all of this, the power to begin to explain climate, the power to begin to inform the sustainable development goals, the power that we have to drive the metrics that are changing the way the intergovernmental process works, we're just at the cusp of being able to make that contribution. And I think we're looking at the power of the individual pen and map becoming something where we can empower that to change the world. And I think you're in the right building to be able to start doing that. Let's show the power of the map by showing the trust and building that trust so that our hat is something that begins to drive this and begins to set up a process where OpenStreetMap essentially gives voice to all of those folks who have not had chairs that you're currently sitting in. Thank you. Go ahead and scream it if it's not going to work. Just stand up and scream. Uh, Eric Anderson from Global. So we have a lot of issues too as well when it comes to... Uh, Oh, hey, now it's working. We have a lot of issues, too, as well, when it comes to near real-time reporting of information, especially in crises. And we found that just going out to data sources and trying to get that doesn't work, meaning you need services for interoperability and to be able to consume the data real-time to report it on a map, you know. 
So I'd really like to see the community make some kind of efforts or direction into services where you can consume that information as it occurs to get relayed out to other parties. And that's kind of a, you know, how can you do real-time uh, reporting of, you know, of information in crisis is without something like this. Is there, and also, uh, just uh, you know, a little warning over the history that I know you don't like institutional supports, but sometimes you can become a victim of your own success without the support of those institutions too as well. So just FYI, I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on providing services for real-time uh, reporting of information, especially in needs of crises. Uh, I'm violently nodding my head up and down, yes, absolutely. Um, the, the problem is, Many of the institutions that, that need to make these decisions need the APIs to be able to not only access it in real time, uh, they also need to understand where it came from, the provenance, and I know this is a, a bit of a, a grading, and I know I said this in 2010 at State of the Map, but we need historicals. We need to be able to compare how things have changed. Um, and that process of being able to do that in real time and having services to do that is, is a critical one. I do know that the humanitarian side of open, of open street map is putting pressure on the operational side where we don't necessarily have all the resources to be able to drive those servers to do it. And I think that's something where we, we need to set up some kind of a partnership to make sure that we're able to build that capacity or create a parallel capacity in some way that allows us to, to get to those services and have that type of, of speed and redundancy in history. where that information comes from and if it's authoritative for the reporting of that information. Open street maps would be a great place to drive something like that. I think we need to explore that. I'd love to talk to you uh, uh, in one of the, the, the hallway on that and we'll, we'll probably take that up. All right. That'd be great. Any other questions? I know I don't want to take Mikkel's time. I heard. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, my name is Dami. Um, I work with eHealth Africa from Nigeria. Um, I would like to understand how you prioritize um, where to give this sort of um, humanitarian assistance. Um, I'm, I'm asking this question um, because um, we, we work with HOT also. Um, so um, there's a lot of um, stuff that are happening in the northern part of Nigeria. And recently, we gave some data um, to the hot community to help with some of the insurgencies that were happening in Bono. Um, and then, you know, I think it was after then that the um, Nepal earthquake started. And I think everything around Bono just got stopped, you know, and then everyone's focus shifted. So, um, First, I would like to understand how you um, make these priorities, and then in what ways um, could we help if we had to, so that um, you know um, some other priorities don't suffer when moving to other priorities. It's a great question and an important one, and not one limited to hot. Within the international development community, within humanitarian operations. There are many times where the sexy catastrophic crisis, the sudden onset emergency, takes over for the long-term difficult work of working in a place where the, a conflict or a long-term problem has, ta you know, basically takes the resources and pushes them towards uh, a, cat a catastrophe. HOT is, I think, in a place where it needs to make some choices on that. And um, this is something where a process for deciding that, to my knowledge, and I'd have to turn to Mikkel, doesn't yet exist for determining on exactly how uh, HOT is going to allocate which staff to which area and which volunteers to which area. And it's something that we need to build. And I would encourage you to let's come and talk and let's figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, John. What? Thank you, John.